Hello, and welcome to Special Situations and Affiliated Hazards for Nanomaterials. My name is Pete Rayner. I'm a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. The learning objectives are that by the end of this module, learners should be able to identify high risk fire and explosion conditions for nanomaterials, select appropriate cleanup procedures in nanomaterial workplaces, recognize physical agent exposure risks affiliated with nanomaterial production, and recognize non-particulate chemical exposure risks affiliated with nanomaterial production. Broadly, in nanotechnology, we can consider two major sets of health risks. The health risks caused by exposures to the nanomaterials themselves, and health risks and, and health risks caused by exposures to hazardous agents that are part of the nanomaterial production and use. Let's start by talking a little bit about combustible dusts. According to OSHA, combustible dusts are fine particles that present an explosion hazard when suspended in the air in certain conditions. The National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, defines combustible dust, or, or rather a combustible particulate solid, as something that presents a fire or deflagration hazard when suspended in air or some other oxidizing medium over a range of concentrations, regardless of particle size or shape. And a deflagration you can think of as a fire that moves outward, um, subsonic, but still kind of a, a spreading explosive type situation. What materials can uh, create combustible dust? Well, the majority of natural and synthetic organic materials and some metals can form combustible dust. Materials that burn in solid form can be explosive when in finely divided form, even if they might not be so when they're not finely divided. divided. Uh, the NFPA says, and this is a quote, any industrial process that reduces a combustible material and some normally non-combustible materials to a finely divided state presents potential for a serious fire or explosion. And dust of the same chemical material will have different ignitability and explosibility depending on the particle size, the shape, and the moisture content of the material. So how does a dust combust? Well, most commonly you have dust that settles on a flat surface and, and usually uh, not just a, a very thin layer. This is a, a, a noticeable layer of dust. And then some event will disturb that settled dust and, and make it uh, form a cloud in the air. And then in the presence of an ignitable source, uh, the an ignition source, that dust cloud is ignited and creates a combustible situation where the, the um, dust ignites and you get this deflagration where the flames uh, move outward and, and becomes a, 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 a larger situation. Dust explosions are kind of thought of in a, as, as the dust explosion pentagon, is the, the factors that are needed to uh, create a combustible dust explosion. So uh, at the bottom you have the dust itself, the combustible dust, and then oxygen and air, which is needed to uh, propagate the uh, combustion uh, of the material. At the top you have ignition, there must be a source that causes the dust to ignite in the oxygen-filled atmosphere. Um, however, there are two other factors that are important too. The, the dispersion of the dust particles, so the, the dust particles have to be dispersed into the air. And then there has to be some confinement of the dust cloud. So uh, it, that could be in some sort of um, uh, vessel or a duct, or it could be uh, in a room. Um, it could be in a mine. Uh, so there's a variety of situations, but it can't be just out in the open air. Uh, 
that situation does uh, tends to not make it a, a combustible environment because the air comes in and and keeps the dust from um, being confined and building up a concentration sufficient to become combustible. So a classic situation for uh, combustible dust are when there is a primary explosion first and then a secondary explosion with the secondary explosion being due to the the combustible dust um, so the primary explosion can come from any number of sources it could in fact be a combustible dust but it also could be a a vessel that is somehow over pressured and uh, bursts in explosively creating a blast wave or it could be uh, some explosion from a tank that contains a flammable material uh, and and that primary explosion creates the bat blast wave that sends the com uh, dust that is accumulated on surfaces into the air, forming a dust cloud. And then uh, the secondary explosion is when that combustible dust then is ignited either uh, by um, the uh, the ignition from the primary explosion, or it could even be another source. But that secondary explosion from the dust can often be much, much worse than the primary expo explosion, um, creating a, a, a disaster. There are a variety of ignition sources that have been identified for dust explosions. These data, kind of the percentages, uh, come from North America, Amer American incidents. Um, so the, the, the biggest chunk here is mechanical sparks. Uh, leading to ignition. Uh, there's welding, self-ignition, uh, materials that can uh, self-ignite, um, hot surfaces, fires, friction, static electricity, uh, smolder spots, which are places where um, there may be layers of dust and, and underneath there could be um, smoldering materials due to hot surfaces underneath that can um, lead to a flameless combustion or even decomposing of organic materials deep underneath a, a layer of dust or deep within a layer of dust. Um, there's also electrical equipment that can contribute to ignition. And there are many different types of dust involved in, in dust explosions. Uh, you see the biggest slice in this diagram is from uh, wood dust. And, and grain dusts are also very common too. You can think of uh, uh, grain silos, for example, as being places where high levels of dust can become, uh, can get into the air and then uh, potentially be ignited. There's synthetic materials, coal and peat. Um, paper is a thin slice there. Uh, the interesting one is metals. Metals can be uh, an important a source of combustible dust explosions, and they're used very commonly in the nanomaterial industry. So there are a number of tests that are used to uh, screen materials for whether they can be combustible or explosive, and uh, sort of the property, if, if they are, then you can define the properties that may indicate how explosive and how damaging that the materials can be. So the first, there's a couple screening tests, the first one being the combustible co combustibility screening test. And um, basically it answers the question, could this material present a fire hazard? And it, it basically is a standard test that determines if a material ignites and the rate of propagation of uh, combustion along the length of a sample. Uh, the explosibility screening test then answers the question, could the material present a combustible dust hazard? It's also referred to as a go or no-go test, and it determines if the material is explosible or not, if it can form a combustible dust explosion. And basically, the dust samples are uh, dispersed in a chamber at, at a variety of concentrations and exposed to an ignition source. Uh, you know, eventually, if it is combustible, explosible, then uh, it will, at a sufficient concentration, it will ignite. So some of the additional tests that are used to uh, 
to determine the properties of a combustible dust. Uh, so the KST is the dust deflagration index, and this uh, property uh, measures the relative explosive uh, explosion severity compared to other dust, so it's a relative scale. Um, Pmax is the maximum explosion overpressure generated in the test chamber. Uh, so it's used to design enclosures and predict the severity of an explosion and the, the consequences you might have from that explosion. So that's related to the maximum pressure that is generated um, during the explosion. DP, DT max is the maximum rate of pressure rise. That's a prediction of the violence of the explosion. And, and this information is also used to uh, calculate the dust deflagration index. MIE is the minimum ignition energy. It predicts the ease and likelihood of ignition of a dispersed dust cloud. And then MEC, or the minimum explosible concentration, measures the minimum dust concentration in the air that is required to spread an explosion. Um, you know, below that concentration, the explosion can't happen. So additional factors uh, that come into play are the particle size, the moisture content of the particles, uh, the dust that's dispersed, the particle shape, the concentration in the air of not just the explosible, the combustible dust, but also other dust, um, the ambient humidity, and the availability of oxygen. So let's talk about a few of the particular properties. So KST, the dust deflagration index, um, the larger the value, the more severe the explosion. And any uh, KST greater than zero is subject to uh, dust deflagration, um, so it can be explosive. So there's sort of uh, four class ratings, zero, uh, one, two, and three. If there's no explosion, the KST is zero. And a, a material that's an example of one that's not explosive is, is silica. Um, a weak explosion can be produced with class one, uh, a, a dust deflagration index between zero and 200. And examples there are powdered milk, charcoal, sulfur, sugar, and zinc. Um, zinc being potentially something that could be in the form of a nanomaterial. Between 200 and 300 uh, KST, there, there's a possibility of a strong explosion. This is dust explosion class two. Examples of materials there include cellulose, wood flour, and polymethyl acrylate. And then the very strong explosions with a KST greater than 300, dust explosion class three, include anthraquinone, aluminum and magnesium. So in particular, aluminum is uh, potentially used as an, uh, uh, well, is used as a um, nanomaterial. Uh, so uh, again, uh, a couple of materials there, and there are others uh, that uh, in their nanoscale state um, could possibly be combustible dust. So particle size is important. Dust particles greater than 400 micrometers, so micrometers, not nanometers, are not combustible. In the past, the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA standard 654, defined combustible dust as being less than or equal to 420 micrometers in diameter, and that's the material that passes through a US number 40 standard sieve. Um, now, uh, size criterion has largely been removed in, in many standards. There's still a few that use a size criterion. A couple of NFPA standards are listed there. Um, however, the reason it's, it's not used so much anymore is that uh, certain particles, uh, fibrous particles, flaky particles, may not be able to pass through a number 40 sieve, but they still have a surface to volume ratio uh, sufficient to pose a deflagration hazard. So that's kind of important, having a lot of surface area is, is what drives the, the risk here. So the minimum explosive concentration, MEC, um, is, is another really important uh, parameter. Uh, it measures the minimum amount of dust dispersed in air required to spread an explosion. 
Um, and uh, basically, the, the test is conducted so that a, a, in, inside a chamber, uh, obviously a heavily fortified chamber and, and well-controlled situation, the concentration of the dust within the chamber is varied in increments moving upwards until uh, a, a, a threshold explosion over pressure is measured. So, so basically, when you get to an explosion situation, you gradually move up in concentration. And once you get to an explosive situation, that's the minimum explosive concentration in this test. So when the, in, in a workplace, when the dust cloud concentration is greater than the MEC, uh, if there's ig an ignition source present, a, a fuel, um, oxygen, uh, and then confinement, you'll get an explosion. Um, it's also sometimes referred to, the MEC is referred to as a lower explosive limit for the dust, and the, the flammable range uh, for the dust is, could be considered between a lower explosive limit and, and an upper explosive limit, which is, is uh, not generally measured. Most dust has a, a minimum explosive concentration between 15 grams per cubic meter to 1,200 grams per cubic meter. So note the, the, the units here, grams per cubic meter. So they're very, very high concentrations, uh, which is why uh, combustible dust explosions are relatively rare. Um, so this is orders of magnitude higher than health-based exposure limits. So, you know, if, uh, we're talking uh, 15 milligrams per cubic meter as being the OSHA permissible exposure limit for um, total dust. Um, so that's three orders of magnitude lower concentration than kind of the, the usual lowest concentration at which you'll, you'll find an MEC. So these are very, very high concentrations of dust. That uh, MEC also varies with material and the, the, the particle size. So if we look at the MEC for nanomaterials, you can see um, a plot here where on the vertical axis is the minimum explosive dust concentration, so the MEC in grams per cubic meter. And then the horizontal axis is uh, the median particle size of the dust in micrometers. So you're looking at 0.1 micrometer and less would be uh, the nanoscale range. And uh, these, this data was compiled by Safe Work Australia from a number of authors. And you can see that um, the author, authors looked at coal, uh, aluminum, and carbon nanotubes and carbon blacks. Um, the lines represent uh, coal and, and also polyethylene. So the green and red lines show uh, coal as a function of size. And you see that for coal particles, if you get below about 10 um, micrometers, you have a leveling off of the minimum explosible dust concentration uh, at about, you know, uh, between 100 and 150 grams per cubic meter. So when you go to higher dust concentration or higher particle sizes, you need um, even higher concentrations to reach the minimum explosive concentration. For polyethylene in blue, uh, for particles about oh, several tens of micrometers and smaller, it's uh, again pretty much a a minimum a, a constant minimum explosible dust concentration, uh, a little less than 50 grams per cubic meter. For the other uh, tests of, of note, um, most of the minimum explosive explosive concentrations are hover around 50 grams per cubic meter. Um, some of the aluminum in the, the green and red pluses are a little bit below 50. The carbon blacks are a little bit higher and the nanotubes are a little bit lower. But you see there's not much difference um, once you get bef below 10 to 100 micrometers in the minimum explosible dust concentration as long as you're uh, at least with the same material. And it should be pointed out that this is a really, really high concentration, particularly for nanomaterials. Uh, if you think about how much mass a, a 10 nanometer or even a 100 nanometer particle 
has, it's not very much compared to a 10 micrometer or a 100 micrometer particle. So you need a lot of particles to be aerosolized in order to reach that very high mass concentration. The minimum ignition energy, MIE, for nanomaterials is, is a little more um, dependent on size. Uh, and you see here, there's a lot of different materials. It's a little bit of a complicated graph, but the minimum ignition energy is on the vertical axis and, and medium particle size of the material um, is on the horizontal axis. And you see uh, uh, three different regions defined here as sort of being not sensitive to ignition uh, for a material, sensitive to ignition, and very sensitive. And what, if you get down into the nanoscale size, um, there are some materials that kind of border the sensitive to not sensitive uh, range, and those are mostly carbon-based materials. So you have carbon blacks up there, uh, multi wall carbon nanotubes, um, carbon nanofibers, fibers, and, and car some other carbon nanotubes. So the carbon based ones have a relatively high um, minimum ignition energy. But when you look uh, below into the very sensitive region in the nano scale, you get a variety of materials uh, such as zinc and aluminum. And uh, what are some of the others here? Um, some optical brightener, iron, um, and titanium that are, uh, you know, pretty sensitive. They have low minimum ignition energies, which means they're easily ignited. So, um, so some materials that are metal, more metal, tend to be more metallic, are more likely to be ignited than ones that are. Uh, uh, based on carbon, and and they tend to be ignited more easily in the nano range than in the microscale range. What standards are are uh, available to for guidance related to combustible dust? Well. OSHA uh, cites combustible dust hazards under the general duty clause, so employers must keep workplaces free from recognized hazards likely to cause death or serious physical harm. Um, and they will not directly cite NFPA standards, but they can sort of use that as guidance and recommendation because, um, you know, the, the National Fire Protection Association has a number of standards that are well known and should be applied in workplaces. Um, so the NFPA has standards for the prevention of fires and dust explosions in agricultural and food processing facilities, standard for combustible metals, metal powders, and metal dusts, a standard for the prevention of fire and dust explosions from uh, the manufacturing, processing, and handling of combustible particle solids, and there are other standards that refer to these same um, hazards and risks. So identifying the hazards is really important. And, and really, you're looking at the um, combustible dust uh, pentagon here to, as guidance for identifying hazards. So any materials that can be combustible when finely divided, and that's most materials that are finely divided, can in principle be combustible. Um, and uh, also processes which use, consume, and produce combustible dusts are ones to to realize present this risk. Um, you should also be aware of open areas where combustible dust may build up and try to uh, minimize that buildup. And also look for hidden areas where combustible dust may accumulate. So if there's, uh, there's vessels or corners uh, where dust may be hidden, uh, you know, if, if they are disturbed and there's an ignition source, that Explosion can come from a hidden area just as well as it might come from an open area. Uh, also being at, to identify ways in which the dust may be dispersed in the air once it's settled uh, and trying to prevent that dispersion. And also uh, preventing the, uh, the possibility of ignition sources, um, particularly in the areas where combustible dust may be present. So all those, uh, you know, identifying those hazards are ways to prevent uh, 
uh, combustible dust explosions. And then the application of general risk reduction practices too. So uh, equipment or spaces such as dust, duct, ducts, um, dust collectors, um, processing vessels, uh, um, processing equipment should be designed to prevent leaks to minimize the escape of dust into work areas. And they also should be designed to be um, able to be uh, cleaned. And, and uh, in particular, ducts need to be designed with sufficient air velocity moving through them so that dust does not, uh, and, and even smaller particles, does not collect in the ducts. Uh, dust that settles on workplace surfaces should be removed through routinely implemented housekeeping programs so that you don't get, get um, layers of dust collecting. And then areas and, and equipment or equipment subject to explosions, including dust collection systems, um, should be designed so uh, that they relieve pressure in a safe manner um, or with proper suppression. So with explosion prevention systems, uh, uh, an oxygen deficient atmosphere, uh, fire, fire systems, um, and also with venting um, directed um, away from where dust may build up. So often um, having the venting in the system outside so it's not at, at, by an inside source is a, is a way to do this. Dust control is, is critically important. So minimize first, minimizing the escape of dust from processing equipment or ventilation systems, um, using dust collection systems and filters to remove the, any particles, um, utilizing surfaces that minimize dust accumulation and facilitate cleaning, uh, inspecting for dust residues in open and hidden areas at regular intervals, uh, cleaning dust regular residues at regular intervals, using cleaning methods that don't generate dust clouds themselves, particularly if a, a, a ignition sources are present. And as I mentioned on the last slide, locating relief valves, pressure relief valves away from dust hazard areas. So the outside is a great place to locate pressure relief valves or um, areas where, where duct systems uh, would be uh, expected to um, vent the an explosion. Um, fire prevention, so looking at the ignition part of the combustible dust pentagon, use non-sparking electrical equipment and wiring, um, try to control static electricity, bonding equipment to grounding uh, uh, to the ground so that um, there is, is less risk of static. Um, controlling smoking, open flames, sparks and friction in your workplaces can prevent combustible dust explosions. Um, separating materials capable of igniting combustibles from the process materials uh, is, is important. Separating heated surfaces and heating systems from dust is critical, as well as using proper fire extinguishers and sprinkler systems. Um, as far as housekeeping, how to do that, nothing fancy is needed. Uh, you can use uh, existing methods. Um, and, and good housekeeping is important, not just for combustible dust explosions, but for um, other fires, explosive uh, explosions, and general safety as well. Um, in general, clean, well-maintained work sites are less likely to experience um, incidents. So cleaning, again, we've talked, this has been talked about in other modules, uh, but wet wiping methods are best. That may be less easy if there are large surfaces that need to be cleaned. Um, HEPA filtered vacuums are okay. They will tend to collect the dust um, well without uh, the dust passing through the, the vacuum and becoming aerosolized. Dry wiping and sweeping isn't recommended in, in most cases, although it may be, uh, if it's done carefully, when no ignition sources are around, it might be possible, particularly if you have large areas that have um, existing um, layers of dust, thick layers of dust, um, that may be the only way you're able to do the cleaning, but you should take extra precaution to make sure that there are no ignition sources uh, possible.
And then air jets should be avoided in cleaning uh, because you're going to resuspend the dust very easily, more easily even than with dry wiping or sweeping. Okay, so let's talk about some of the physical agent exposure risks that may be present in nanomaterial workplaces that are, again, kind of separate from the nanomaterials themselves. Um, so these include electrical hazards, um, fire and explosion hazards that you know are separate from the combustible dust, um, and others such as noise, radiological hazards, uh, lasers, and heat. They're all potential physical agent exposure risks. We're not going to focus on the latter four today. We're going to talk a little bit about electrical hazards and fire and explosion hazards. Uh, electrical hazards can be caused by faulty equipment and instrument instrumentation or wiring. And the outcomes could include electrical shock, arc blasts, electrocutions, fires, or even explosions caused by the electrical hazards. <clears throat> um, electricity exposure risks include insulation on wires that is degraded by corrosive chemicals, solvent vapors, or, or ozone from machines that could be present in workplaces. Or they may be very localized um, with near a machine. Um, degraded insulation on electrical equipment in wet locations creates a huge risk of electrical exposure, electricity exposure. Sparks from electrical equipment can be ignition sources for flammable vapors or combustible dust. And equipment may utilize high voltages and stored electrical energy that, that may be um, special risks to workers. Prevention of exposures includes following standards. In particular, the electrical equipment must be free from recognized hazards. That's a, 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 a standard OSHA requirement. Equipment must be or should be installed and used per instructions from the manufacturer or supplier. Uh, access and space provided around electrical equipment is important so that when work needs to be done on the equipment that, that it can be done easily and without, um, want, without making uh, electricians and others want to uh, do the work without having to, to uh, get up and down very much if, if it's a tight fit. So providing access and space allows people to work more safely. Uh, proper grounding of electrical machinery and instruments is important. Removing damaged electrical receptacles and portable electrical equipment from service is important. And having appropriate work practices and, and uh, particularly training to those who work with electric electrical um, devices is important. Let's talk a little bit about fire hazards and we'll come back to them again uh, one more time. But ignition of flammable gases, liquids and solvents is, is a possibility in any workplace that, that has uh, a variety of chemicals like might be present in a nano, nanotechnology facility. Um, in laboratories, hot devices such as ovens, hot plates, burners, all present a risk. Faulty electrical appliances can create fire hazards, as we've already discussed. And for combustible dust, dust we, we talked about the dust explosion pentagon. Uh, for fires, there's the fire triangle, which has similar features. Um, the need is for, for a fire to occur is that for there to be oxygen, uh, fuel, and an ignition source, so oxygen, fuel, and heat. Um, that can create a fire. So that can also help guide you as to how to, to prevent fires. So ways to prevent and control fire hazards include having a written emergency plan um, and uh, minimizing flammable, flammable materials where present. Uh, again, as we talked about for combustible dust, having proper housekeeping, using equipment per directions, having uh, barriers around flammable materials, so, such as shielding around equipment, um, closing hood sashes, closing laboratory doors, all are ways to uh, control the risks from uh, 
potential risks from fire hazards. Also, storing uh, solvents and, and flammable liquids in flammable liquid storage cabinets is a way to keep them controlled. Wearing proper clothing and PPE, so uh, things that don't build up static uh, when working around flammable materials are really critical. And wearing PPE, um, uh, gloves, and perhaps uh, fire protective clothing if uh, working in situations that are um, really risky. Uh, and in many hazards, but particularly when there's fire hazards, avoiding solo work is important so that you have somebody to, to help monitor the situation that you're working in. Um, training and drills are critical. So you see over on the right, there's a fire drill taking place in an office environment. Uh, so practicing that so people know what to do in the event of an emergency can help um, save lives and uh, prevent injuries. Having fire extinguishers present and with people knowing how to use them, um, making sure they're maintained properly is important. And then having proper signage for people leaving and, uh, and warning sirens, things like that, like shown uh, in the bottom image at right. So remember the acronym RACE. Uh, R is for rescue and remove all occupants, occupants when there's a, a fire. A is for activate the alarm. C is to confine the fire by closing a door if possible. And E is evacuate and or extinguish the fire. R-A-C-E. Let's talk a little bit about some chemical hazards. Uh, that And many chemicals are used in nanomaterial production. Uh, some of them are listed here. And there are many, many others. And they can be solids, liquids, gases. So there's a variety of chemical hazards present other than directly from the nanomaterials. Uh, the globally harmonized system for which pictographs are shown on the right is a way that um, the hazards of chemicals are, are identified and communicated to workers. And uh, you can see a whole uh, nine pictograms that range from uh, provide information about physical hazards, human health hazards, and environmental hazards. Let's talk about some of the hazards identified in the, the Globally Harmonized System, or GHS, on the following slides. So physical hazard classifications include explosives, flammable gases, liquids, and solids, self-reactive substances, pyrophoric substances, self-heating substances, oxidizing substances and organic peroxides, radioactive substances, substances corrosive to metal, and then a mis miscellaneous category. Health hazard classifications include acute toxicity, so things that are immediately dangerous, uh, skin corrosion irritation, hazards, serious eye damage or eye irritation hazards, um, chemicals that cause respiratory or skin sensitization, ones that cause uh, mutagenicity to germ cells, or um, have been identified as being carcinogenic to people, or potentially so, uh, reproductive toxins, and then toxins to specific target organs that can occur on a single exposure or after repeated exposure, and then also aspiration hazards. And there are uh, the following environmental hazard classifications, acute and chronic uh, aquatic toxins, and then um, chemicals that are hazardous to the ozone layer. So let's take a look at a few of these um, classifications and some examples of each. Um, we've talked about these uh, a couple of times already, flammable materials, but there are flammable gases, liquids, and solids. They're highly ignitable materials, and fires, they may lead, cause fires that lead to explosions. And some examples of them are hydrogen, methane, dichlorosilane, and sodium borohydride. So management of flammable chemical risks uh, include keeping substances away from Heat sparks, open flames, and hot surfaces. Avoid smoking in workplaces. 
in case of leaking gas fires, don't extinguish unless the leak can be stopped uh, because you're going to create a situation that, that may be worse than, uh, than the current one. Um, eliminate ignition sources if it's safe to do so. Um, store substances in well-ventilated areas. And, and a common theme, of course, will be to follow the manufacturer's safety data sheet that, sh based on, on the globally harmonized system, should communicate good information about um, control of risks. Oxidizing gases, liquids, and solids present similar risks as flammable substances. Um, these materials contribute or yield oxygen that can cause or enhance combustion of, an, of organic matter. Um, so they, they may end up um, causing or intensifying a fire or explosion. Some examples include nitrates, peroxides, nitric acid. So management of these risks include um, storing oxidizing chemicals away from certainly uh, combustible materials, but also even clothing. Um, keeping valves and fittings free from oil and grease so, so they won't be, uh, have a risk of being oxidized. Stopping le leaks if and when it's safe to do so. Um, wearing protective gloves and eye protection and other appropriate PPE, storing the materials in well-ventilated areas, and following the manufacturer's SDS. Um, pyrophoric chemicals are interesting. They are liquids, solutions, solids, or gases that can ignite spontaneously in the presence of oxygen, or they're uh, materials that may react with water to produce heat, and hydrogen, which, which can uh, create a flammable or explosive situation. So there's a variety of common pyrophoric chemicals listed on the right in the table, uh, divided into liquids and solutions, solids, and gases. Um, some, some key materials include um, lithiums, uh, li uh, so materials that can be used in batteries can be potentially pyrophoric materials. Um, there's a bunch of hydrides uh, that are metal hydrides that are solids um, that can uh, be pyrophoric as well as some more lithium containing materials. Interestingly, finely divided metals are a category here. So things like um, titanium, zinc, and zirconium can potentially be um, nanomaterials that could be pyrophoric um, and and uh, also listed under solids and materials that could be uh, uh, um, nanomaterials uh, including carbon um, and nickel. Uh, gases can potentially also be pyrophoric uh, and so gases like uh, silane and phosphine are used in uh, nanomaterial production. So silanes can be used to um, make silicon dioxide uh, particles. So, um, you know, there are pyrophoric chemicals that are used in nanomaterial production. So that, that's a consideration um, that's affiliated with the, the production process. So how do you manage pyrophoric chemical risks? Well, again, keep them away from heat, sparks, open flames, and hot surfaces. Avoid smoking in the workplaces. Uh, do not allow contact with air with these um, materials. And that's uh, looking at the bottom uh, bullet point again, following the man manufacturer's safety data sheet, uh, being sure that you identify pyrophoric chemicals so that you know that they shouldn't be exposed to air. Uh, again, where Wearing appropriate PPE is important. If pyrophoric chemicals uh, get on a person's skin, you want to immerse them in cold water or, or and uh, wrap with a wet bandage. And in case of fire, you're able to use a fire extinguisher on, on these materials, sort of blunting their ability to uh, the air to get at the materials. Uh, hazards are associated in, in nanomaterial production with gases under pressure. So a compressed gas is a substance which at uh, room temperature and atmospheric pressure is a gas, but under pressure is uh, liquefied or becomes dissolved in a liquid. 
Gases under pressure, uh, can, gases can be as high as 3,000 PSI, typically um, uh, in, in the compressed gas tanks, like the one shown at right. Um, the risks posed by gases under pressure include um, direct risks of injury. And in particular, the, the classic example is if a compressed gas tank uh, has the cap off and falls over so that there's just a valve there and the valve um, is somehow falls into something so that it's broken and and the valve can burst off due to the pressure and be thrown um, ejected through uh, uh, at very high velocity they've been known to go through um, concrete walls uh, so so these are very risky situations and, and compressed gas tanks, compressed gas cylinders should not be um, handled carelessly by any means. Uh, also, if the compressed gas is released um, without regulation, there is a risk of coal burns because of the sudden uh, loss of pressure. The temperature goes way down too with, with a release and um, so uh, exposure to cold um, can be a very important risk. So examples of gases under pressure that may be relevant in, in nanomaterial production include phosphine, um, silane, as, as I mentioned earlier, and arsine. So management of compressed gases or gases under pressure you want to keep them away from heat, flames, and direct sun because those can make the pressure increase inside the cylinder uh, and potentially make the valve burst or the cylinder burst. You want to store the gases in well-ventilated areas. Uh, sec secure compressed gas cylinders to a wall or bench with chains or straps. Assure that valves and uh, pressure regulators are not damaged or corroded. Um, when the cylinder is not in use, you want to have the valve cap on it so that if something happens, the tank falls over, that cap will protect the valve and you won't get a situation where you have a, 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 a very fast moving projectile that, that could injure someone. And uh, if there's a risk of the uh, pressure being rapidly reduced without regulation, um, you want to be, care be careful and wear cold insulating gloves, uh, eye protection, and a face shield. Related often to compressed gases are, are the risks from asphyxiant gases. Um, so an asphyxiant gas is a, a non-toxic or minimally toxic gas that displaces oxygen in breathing air. So, um, and of course, breathing oxygen depleted air can lead to death. Um, asphyxiant gases are relatively inert and odorless, and as a result, dangerous levels may not be noticed um, readily. Um, and a classic situation can be where uh, a, a compressed gas tank is, for whatever reason, releases its, its gases, and, and uh, that concentration of the, the gas in the tank can um, be so dramatic uh, it's it's even though it's compressed once it's uncompressed it can take a significant amount of the uh, space in the room and lead to a an a, a, a oxygen depleted atmosphere so examples of asphyxiant gases are methane nitrogen argon helium butane and propane carbon dioxide can be an asphyxiant gas as well So management of risks from asphyxiant gases include um, using the, the proper management of uh, compressed gases, gases under pressure that we talked about previously. When there's entry into confined spaces, uh, checking the oxygen concentration is really important to make sure that, that the oxygen has not been displaced by an asphyxiant gas. Uh, Storing asphyx asphyxiant gas containers in well-ventilated areas can help so that if there's a gradual release of <clears throat> the gas that it will be uh, removed um, and, and um, uh, oxygen will be uh, able to replace it. Providing training to workers on asphyxiant gas risks is important. And then if you're responding to a, a, 
a situation where asphyxiant gases may be present, wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA, is necessary for respiratory protection. Um, the last category we're going to talk about is corrosive substances, and they're substances that, by their direct a uh, action, are damaging to body tissue or corrosive to metal. And general categories include acids, alkalis, so acids and bases, uh, corrosive dehydrating agents, corrosive oxidizing agents, organic corrosive agents. Um, so there's a whole range of examples, just a couple here, sodium borohydride. Uh, and hydrofluoric acid are, are both examples of <clears throat> corrosive substances. Hydrofluoric acid is sometimes used in etching for uh, nanomaterials uh, uh, to, to get surfaces that are uh, desirable in, um, in, in nanoscale uh, form. Management of corrosive substances include to store um, them in a corrosion-resistant container uh, with a resistant inner liner, and, and often using the original container that they're shipped in is best. You want to make sure to prevent damage to the container, um, and that may come from outside too, not just inside. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if it's a container that's um, uh, metal, uh, you might want to make sure that, that there's nothing from outside that corrodes it or rusts it. Uh, absorb spillage uh, right away. Avoid skin contact, obviously. Wear protective gloves, clothing, boots, safety goggles, face shields, and other PPE that may be required. And, and certainly follow the guidance in the manufacturer's safety data sheet. So to summarize here, um, nanoparticles have uh, uh, difficult to achieve minimum explosive concentrations, uh, similar to microscale particles, um, you know, as far as the presenting risks for combustible dust explosions. So they're difficult to achieve because these concentrations are very high for any material, but for the nanoscale, because each individual particle is, is very small, uh, it's really hard to get that many particles into the air to achieve a minimum explosive concentration. Not that it is impossible. Um, metal nanoparticles in particular, however, have a low minimum ignition energy, and uh, so they may present the greatest risks amongst nanoparticles of, of being combustible when dispersed in air. Uh, physical hazards such as electricity and fire are present in nanotechnology workplaces just as they are in other types of workplaces. And then a variety of chemicals used in nanomaterial production present hazards um, that are classified according to GHS, the Globally Harmonized System. And those risks should be minimized during production just like the risks associated with the nanomaterials themselves. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training Program, or METFAST program, which is a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Um, this, the content of this lesson is the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. <laughs>